then let's get started. Um, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to talk about CA Sync, um, a new project that I have been working on. Um, by the way, if there's people standing around here, that you can actually go up there as well and look down here if you still want some more closer look on this. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, CA Sync. CA Sync is a new project I've been working on. It's uh, it's a system for um, synchronizing uh, OS images um, from the internet to your devices. It's uh, supposed to be a generic tool, so um, this is a talk that hopefully is interesting um, both for embedded developers and for um, uh, server people, but also actually for desktop people. So uh, yeah, it's uh, supposed to be generic infrastructure. Nothing, nothing specific. It's not a product. It's just a building block. You can build your stuff from. So yeah, the name CA Sync um, is supposed to reflect um, the major two inspirations um, that uh, um, led to CA Sync. The first one is content addressable. Content addressable file systems, um, I'm pretty sure everybody of you already came in contact with um, because that's what Git is, um, meaning that you have a hash that ident identifies some blob of some kind and uh, you use the hash to reference it. So the address of that content is the hash. And then there's another concept uh, which all of you probably also came in contact with, which is rsync. Um, rsync is a f generic file synchronization tool. Um, there's actually a very interesting um, uh, algorithm behind it. Most people who use rsync probably ever never uh, came come into contact into that uh, with that amazing um, uh, algorithm. Most people just assume it's kind of like a SCP that works better, right? But actually, it's way more than that, and uh, it's 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 pretty exciting technology that people invented in in the 90s or something. And I think it's technology that deserves like this. Rsync algorithm that deserves um, a lot more room in the in the in the light because it's so awesome. Um, CA Sync is just the combination of these two ideas: content addressable file systems and uh, the Rsync algorithm. So, uh, what does that specifically mean? It's a content addressable data synchronization tool. It's a file system tree synchronizer. Um, it's basically um, supposed to speed up synchronizing file system trees if you have multiple of them and they are large but very similar. The use cases I already mentioned that are if you if you want to update your OS, if you want to update your containers, if you want to update your IoT devices, your VM images if you have them, um, it's about delivering the initial image as well as about um, doing updates. Later on um, it's, uh, it can have different uh, related use cases as well. Um, one of them being uh, synchronizing your home directory or doing backups, right? Like the big difference is in the in the first use case, like delivering images to to clients, it's about downloading something from the internet and installing locally. Um, in the case of home synchronization and backup, it's the other way around, right? Like you have something on the individual device and you push it into the cloud. Um, the actual problem sets are very similar. Um, but also distinct in some cases. That's why for now we only focus on the first bit, but the later bit hopefully comes later as well. CA Sync, um, in contrast to rsync, is a tool that can actually work on two different layers. Um, one of the layers is a block layer, right? You can actually um, use it to deliver uh, file systems um, on the block layer. I mean, actually, actual raw file system images, like a XT3, XT3 image um, that you read from disk or a SquashFS image or whatever you have. It can also operate on the file system level. That's how rsync does it, right? Like um, um, that we actually look at the individual files and directories and the metadata about them and serialize them. Um, the fact that it does this makes it actually particularly powerful. Um, different use cases might want to deliver things on different layers. Like, for example, if you do IoT stuff, it might be interesting to deliver images on the block layer, right? Like you want to have your SquashFS and you want to deliver it as SquashFS and should always, always be your SquashFS. Um, other use cases, the file system level is more interesting. Like containers traditionally, um, like Docker and these kind of things, uh, deliver their stuff as a tarball, hence they operate on the file system level. So um, yeah, in that area, it might more, make more sense to, to operate on the file system level. I mean, then Snap, um, like this, this Ubuntu um, desktop app thing actually works on the file system level as well. So I mean, really depends on your use case, on what you're designing stuff for, um, whether you want to 
operate on the block layer or on the system layer level, uh, and that's both okay. So let's actually have a technical look at what uh, CA Sync now really does um, and why it is an interesting um, concept. Um, for that, we'll just discuss what it actually is doing if you um, uh, upload or download an image with CA Sync. The first step of that is um, of the uploading now. It's uh, we serialize all things, right? On the block layer, that's actually easy. We just read the sectors of the disk, right? Like one after the other, um, and uh, have a serialization because I mean that's actually what the block device is. On the file system layer, it's almost as easy, and everybody is used to this kind of stuff um, because it's yeah effectively tar it up, right? Go through all the files and directories. Uh, put them in a specific order, store some metadata about it, and turn it into a big, long stream. That's the first step. The second step is now split up the serialization, right? Specifically, we take the serialization and chop it up into a series of chunks. Now, the interesting thing about this is we don't chop it up in, uh, into chunks of the same size always, um, which is what traditional systems do. What we ch chunk it up in, in uh, chunks of varying sizes, where the sizes depend on the contents of the blocks, right? Um, so the same data should result in the same chunk size individually. Why this complexity of having varying sizes, size blocks? This is um, to deal uh, nicely with um, if you have multiple images that are very similar but also different. Um, because let's say you have version one of your file directory tree and then version two of the file directory tree, and it changed very little. However, a couple of bytes were inserted somewhere in a text file where you noticed you made a typo and, and mistyped a comma for, for a full stop and you wanted to fix that, right? Um, so you added a couple of bytes and removed a couple of bytes or something like that. Now, if um, you made this change, and if, you, if we would chunk everything up into equally sized blocks, this would basically mean that from that point on where your change actually was made, all the blocks following would change as well, right? Like because um, a few bytes might be added to this, these blocks so that the, uh, to the end they have to be rem removed or the other way around, right? So this is kind of a ripple effect. If you use equally uh, sized blocks all the time, it basically means up to the point where your first change is, um, the blocks will stay the same. Everything after that will um, basically explode and become a change. If you, however, use um, varying size blocks where the block size is derived from the contents of the block, you can protect yourself from that. So ultimately, um, what you get is that, uh, yeah, um, the block immediately surrounding it will change, but as soon as uh, enough um, time or enough uh, bytes um, have been processed afterwards, you're back in the original um, uh, chunk size uh, logic, so you actually um, get back to the same chunk size as before the change. The algorithm, um, this is actually what the rsync algorithm is about, right? This is the stuff that the people who invented rsync actually came up with. So that it only in rsync, though, becomes uh, visible if you actually have two file system trees where two files, like in the source and the destination tree, actually carry the exact same name because only then rsync actually um, starts doing its um, uh, rsync algorithm. If the file system trees have the same files but they have different names, then rsync is not able to optimize anything there. So, um, the way that actually works with the with uh, recognizing like like deriving the size um, of chunks um, from the contents of the chunks is by using a uh, so-called cyclic hash function. It's basically, I mean, we could actually use any hash function, right? Like anything like that is remotely um, similar to a cryptographic hash function, even. Um, but it would be pretty inefficient if we did. So what, what actually happens there is that we go through the, through the data streams through our serialization and hash the first byte and the second byte, and then um, we the first, second, and third byte, and the first, second, and fourth byte, and so on. We do this um, in a sliding window over the entire um, serialization stream. And yeah, for every combination, basically, we calculate the hash function, and then we do a test. Um, uh, with the resulting hash function of every single byte ultimately, or every single window at every single byte position, um, the test used is this modulo operation here. Actually, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly this modulo operation. This is what we use in CA Sync for a couple of reasons, but you can uh, use anything else. It basically just like 
Yeah, it's a modal operation, and by uh, like h being the hash um, value that you calculated at a specific position, q being something like like a, a value which allows you to pick the average chunk size, right? So under the assumption that the hash function would be close to perfect, this would basically mean by by picking q, we can make it more likely or less likely to put a put a um, cut a chunk cut at a specific byte. Right, so um, yeah, on top of this, um, on top of uh, doing this hash trick that we basically ca calculate the hash function on every single byte for um, the window and uh, do the test, we also enforce a maximum and a minimum chunk size. Meaning, uh, even if the hash um, tests very early on, we ignore, like, like the, the test succeeds very early on, we ignore that un until we reach a certain minimum amount of bytes. And uh, similar, if we reach the maximum amount of bytes uh, with our chunking, um, without actually having ever uh, tested the test successfully, we force a break so that, uh, yeah, basically we can say our chunks have a minimum size and a maximum size, and um, in average they're somewhere in between. Um, yeah, by picking Q, we can the right way we can select the average chunk size. After we did the chunking, right, now we, like, let's recapit recapitulate. Um, after we serialized everything, after we chunked everything up, we now have these little blocks, um, all of different sizes, that together um, um, result in the original um, stream again. We then take each individual chunk, um, calculate the, the uh, hash value of it, a strong hash function in this case, right? The original one, the cyclic one, which we used for the chunking, is only used for the chunking. For the chunking. Now that we have chunked things up, we forget about all that um, and apply a strong hash function, a cryptographically strong hash function, to that to make this ch chunk recognizable, right? What we actually do here is SHA-512-256, that is something. It's actually it's a it's a standards defined um, hash function that is um, basically SHA-512 um, cut off at uh, 265 bytes, uh, and with a different initialization. The reason why we use this is actually because we want something relatively short, but something that is relatively quick um, to calculate. And uh, uh, yeah, on most CPUs of today, SHA-512 is actually faster to to calculate than SHA-256. Uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, ultimately it doesn't really matter which hash, a cryptographic hash function we use as long as we use a good one. Um, at the same time, where we go through all these chunks that we just generated and calculated the um, hashes of all of them, we write, a, write out an index file. An index file is ultimately just a list of these hashes, right? Hence, the index file identifies the original um, uh, stream perfectly. Because it basically just tell, is a list of uh, chunk identifiers, and if you put the chunk identifier, like the chunks belonging to these identifiers, back together in the same order, you're at the original stream again. Now, after we did that, we actually um, go through all the chunks we generated, and we hashed, and we stored the hash uh, uh, value off, and compress them individually. Then we place these chunks in one special directory. We call that the chunk store. Um, the file name being the hash uh, uh, function, we, uh, the hash value we generated for it. Um, yeah, and we do that in compressed fashion. What uh, The compression we actually use these days is ZSTD, but you can actually choose whatever you want. Um, like you can do it with XZ. Um, uh, XZ is a little bit slower, uh, but compresses a little bit better. ZSTD is kind of the new industry standard, I guess, for people who build new systems, so we use that too. Um, yeah, this this uh, a chunk store is really a very very simple thing, right? It's really just a directory where you have a couple of files that happen to be named after the hashes, and you can actually go to these files, uncompress them on the shell with the ZSTD tools, tools, then uh, pipe it into your SHA-512-256 um, uh, tool and verify that each chunk actually contains exactly what the file name suggests. And after we have done that. It's all complete, right? So again, we took the original, um, like we originally serialized everything, we chunked it into pieces, we calculated the hash function of each of these pieces, we took the hash and denoted it in the index file, we compressed the individual chunks and dropped them in individual files and directory. That's what happens if you uh, package up some kind of directory tree or some kind of um, uh, file system image with CI sync. You, as output, like as input, you put that in, and as output, you get um, one index file 
and uh, one of these store directories. Right? So to make a very brief serialization, chunking, hashing and indexing, and compression and storage is uh, the chain we uh, calculate here. So let's uh, now think about the other operation, extracting it again. Um, for that, we simply reverse this. First step is we acquire the index file. Again, the index file was this list of hashes simply um, refer referencing the chunks. Second step, we acquire and uncompress each chunk file from the chunk store listed in the index file. Right? So now we have the original serialization back. Um, well, after concatenating them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we have the serialization. We simply deserialize that again. Um, we thus regenerate the original block device data or the file system tree. And that's already it. It actually fits on one slide, the extraction there. Um, now you may wonder how does it actually compare to systems that are actually, that are in some ways related to this. Um, like, uh, yeah, first of all, rsync, which is again one of the major inspirations, um, but other systems are, have similar properties like OS tree is one I want to mention, and Restic, which is a, a, a backup tool, but the other like similar systems like Bork or something like this. Um, for us, it's uh, really important we forget the file boundary, right? Like all the other systems tend to um, put a lot of um, value on the file boundary. rsync, for example, it iterates to the file system trees, and the rsync algorithm actually never, as mentioned, never um, is actually used until on the source and on the destination there are two files found that have the exact same pass, right? Until uh, rsync finds that the rsync algorithm isn't used. So for rsync, the file system boundary is everything, right? The file boundary is everything, right? Like it's it's how they think, it's how the algorithm works. It first operates like uh, looks for the files and then it applies the algorithm. CA sync doesn't do that. And CA sync, we give up the file boundary. We really, really don't want the file boundary because. Um, Caring about the file boundary means that small files translate into small blocks, and large files into large blocks. If you, however, first serialize stuff, giving up on the file boundary, you have this nice effect that small files are lumped together, right? Like if you have multiple small files, they become one chunk um, all together. And then on the other hand, large files are split into individual chunks. So in average, you get your average chunk size that we're actually looking for. Um, but uh, you neither have overly small ones nor overly large ones. Um, this is actually a key difference. Like I think, for example, it's one of the weaknesses of, of OS tree that they do not give up on this uh, um, uh, file boundary because for them it basically, I mean, Unix directory trees traditionally have a lot of small files. Like look into Etsy, there's things like Etsy hostname, Etsy hosts, um, Etsy FS step, and usually those files have less than a K uh, uh, bytes or something like that. And if you always generate one object out of that, one chunk out of that, then you pay heavily because you will have so many small chunks around. Um, yeah, this way our chunks are evenly sized and uh, we can even recognize similar blocks in different files, right? right? Which is something that rsync can't do. In rsync, if you rename a file on disk, right, like on this uh, uh, source, um, something that last week was called foo is now called bar, um, and then you rsync it to the destination that had a copy of foo, rsync is not smart enough to notice that the file is already there, just under a different name. Because again, the file boundary is everything for it, and the way into it is the file path, and hence it will not re recognize that. For us, it's different. We don't care about the file boundary. And uh, we hence neatly handle renames um, and things like that, because we actually just care about contents. So why do we all do this? Um, similar file system images will result in mostly the same chunk, fi chunk files, right? Which basically means we can very efficiently store many related trees, right? Like, think about this. Um, you do your IoT development. You have uh, your OS image put together, um, like a classic Unix system in some ways. Usually, between all the versions, most of the thing actually stays exactly the same. It's just where you actually make changes um, where a couple of files change, right? Because of this smart chunking algorithm, um, ultimately, most versions will result in exactly the same chunks. They will uh, end up in exactly the same hash um, values. The only chunks that actually change are the ones that you really actually modified, right? So um, it becomes very efficient to store many related trees. And it's not just about storage, it's also about delivering them. Um, another 
benefit is the stream is always implicitly validated, right? Because everything, like every time you download one of these images, we do a strong, um, uh, like because it's content addressed with a strong hash function, as we download a chunk, we can validate that the chunk actually contains what the name suggests, because the name, after all, is the, the strong hash function. So you get something like DM Verity like behavior. For those who don't know, DM Verity is a, a scheme how it's, it's like a, my other talk actually was a little bit mentioned that as well. Um, it's about um, making block devices um, offline, uh, like secure against offline modification, right? What actually happens there is that every single disk access, uh, read access that you do is verified um, with cryptographic primitives um, to match the original version that was deployed on the system. In uh, CA Sync, we get very similar behavior because um, the index file has the list of all the hashes of all the chunks. And as we go through the serialization, we validate all that. So if the index file wasn't modified, we do know that the entire stream wasn't modified e either. Um, what's also cool about this is when you download um, these images, this becomes very CDN friendly. CDN in the sense of uh, content delivery network, right? Because uh, you by picking this Q parameter of this modulo check that I mentioned, you can uh, actually f configure how small or how large your chunks will be in average. And this is, this is what you want to do if you deploy your images on a CDN, because um, you basically can say, do I want an average relatively small chunks? Um, if you do, um, the chance of reusing old versions um, is increased. However, you lose... Um, uh, you, you pay more money because most of the CDN networks actually um, make you pay for, for individual requests, not for actual sizes. Um, also, the metadata, like the price you pay for, for um, the metadata becomes a little bit higher. If you can also increase the chunk size um, in average, if you like, and if you do, then, of course, um, there's a smaller chance of reusing what you already have. Um, but uh, you have fewer requests, and so you save a little bit of money um, yeah, on your side of things. So, but it's extremely CDN friendly because in average, all the chunks will have the same size. So, um, which is again, like for a system like OS3, that's kind of very expensive thing because uh, uh, as mentioned, they end up usually with lots of very small objects and because you pay for every single object request, um, this kind of breaks the neck of it. Uh, there are other reasons. Um, uh, when acquiring a new version of a file system image, we can actually Employ, the, the, employ this algorithm, like the, the serialization, chunking, things like this, on what we already have. Like, for example, on an old version of the, of the image that we already have, or on a somehow related version of something that is somehow related, right? Um, for example, like if you do an IoT AB setup, right? Like AB setup meaning that you have one um, uh, operating system image on the system that is currently booted, and then the other one, which is the next one that's going to be booted, or that was the last one that's going to be booted, so that you basically always have one version that is in a perfect condition, while the other one is the one that's currently being updated and might be in an imperfect condition. Um, the nice thing is, like, um, if you see async to do updates um, uh, on such a system, um, you can use what you already have on disk um, uh, to update the other version. And uh, yeah, because you will chunk it up the same way, because you will hash it the same way, you can then um, uh, basically do cross updates and uh, recognize all the same blocks and make, copy them locally instead of acquiring them from the internet. So yeah, you basically get a pool of reusable chunks from whatever you throw at CA sync um, to use as a pool. This is actually really powerful because it actually you know, it's it's not just about um, using the exact like I mean the, the the trees that you can use as a pool don't have, actually have to be related to what you want to update to, right? For example, you can do cross updates with this. Like for example, you have a Debian um, OS image or a Debian container image or something like that, and you're downloading a, a Fedora image. Um, uh, for, for your new container or something like that, then there's a very good chance that much of the stuff that's contained in there is actually very similar because Linux distributions don't tend to be completely different. Like they have lots of data like locale data and time zone data that's actually the, the, pretty much the exact same thing on, on all our Linux distributions. So um, yeah, because the CS sync doesn't really care what you throw at it. It tries to find similarities in, in, in what you throw at it and if there are none, it doesn't hurt either. 
So, um, yeah, there's automatic robots reusing of what was downloaded before without there having to be a historical relationship. This is very different from other systems like Westry or things like that, which basically implement a little bit like a version control uh, system, right? Um, because, uh, like, what they do, like, for example, also the Chrome OS update works like this because they generally say, okay, I'm doing an image today and I'm doing an image tomorrow, and to make it uh, efficient, um, for those um, who do this kind of update, I calculate the delta in advance, put that on a server so that people can download the delta. Um, this sounds like a very good solution, but it tends to explode because not everybody updates his, his system all the time, so it's not sufficient to keep one delta around. You basically have to uh, keep deltas around from between all the versions um, that you want to permit upgrades between. And that becomes uh, ultimately very expensive, uh, like just from a ma management perspective, because every single update you do, you have to calculate these deltas to every older version that you might want to support updates from. With CA Sync, you don't need that, right? Like because CA Sync, um, there is like the only delta algorithm is the client requesting the chunks that it needs for its stuff, and it will automatically use what it already has, um, regardless if there's a historical relationship or not. Of course, if there is a historical relationship, there's a much higher chance of it reusing stuff. But if there's not, it's fine. It will still use what is usable and not use what's not. So this makes management of uh, um, providing these images a lot easier because you don't have to think about history anymore. You can just put your stuff there and uh, it will be used if it's possible and if not, it's not. So um, let's focus on a key difference to Docker, right? Like I already mentioned this, CA Sync will not do revision control for you, right? Which I think is actually, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a key thing, right? Like revision control, in my opinion, is, is a very useful developer tool, but it should stay a developer tool. It's not a tool for, for deployment, right? Like it's not a way how you, to optimize your deltas. And Docker and these things, they kind of, um, like, they, they aren't clear on this, right? Like they have this kind of weird version control, which they also use for delivery. Um, and it's, it's how they work, but I don't think they should be intermixed, right? Like, because for version control, you want metadata, you want information about times and whatnot. But for, for deployment, you don't care about all of that. Like, there is no reason on the end user device, um, to know what was the version from last week. All you need to know, yeah, this is the, the block device of the new one, and that's the block of the old one, if you still care. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so much about the difference to the existing systems. I mean, there's lots more, but I don't have infinite time here to talk about them. So, uh, yeah, so much about that. Um, a couple of points unrelated to this specific thing is like one of the questions people might ask is, um, as mentioned, CA Sync can operate on the block layer and it can operate on the file system layer, right? When it operates on the file system layer, it does something that is pretty much tar, right? It goes to the files and directories, serializes everything um, so that it can chunk it up later. Um, so the question is, why don't we actually use tar? Because we don't. Um, the reason for that is uh, we want a couple of, um, of properties that tar cannot provide. So we came up with something, or I came up with something called CA tar, which is, I mean, you can actually use CA sync in this mode as well, right? Like you can just uh, tell um, uh, CA sync to generate a .ca tar file from a directory tree, and it will be pretty much, I mean, then no, no, no chunking, chunking or anything like that will happen, but you will still get the serialization and things like that. Um, not sure why you would do that, but you can if you like to. Um, so CA tar is a lot like tar, but it's strictly reproducible. Right, like, and that's, I, I put a lot of emphasis on this. That basically means that one directory tree will result in the exact same serialization always, right? Which is a property that tar doesn't have. Um, in tar, um, because it's very, very weakly defined, basically you can put the files that are in the, uh, in the tar in any order you like. And actually, that's what most operating systems do, or most implementations of tar do. They do them, uh, they put the files inside of the directories in the order that the file system actually passed them in to the application. And that can be anything. So it really depends if you use XT3 or ButterFS, it will al already be in a different order. And actually, even worse than that, because file systems, even the same implementations, um, tend to uh, not have a, a well defined order in which they return stuff. In CA tar, um, all of that's not permitted. Right, like uh, there is only one valid serialization of uh, one directory tree. So yeah, another big benefit of CA tar that tar doesn't have is its random access. Right, 
I want this ability that if you have serialized everything and you want to jump to file so-and-so in that directory, that you do not have to go through all the beginning of the stream until you find that file, but that you can actually look at the serialization and jump directly to where you need to go, right? So these are the two big things that tar, that classic tar does not provide, that I think are very, very crucial um, for, for a system like this. So random access is kind of cool because it basically allows you to mount the CA sync archives, the CAT, CATAR files, um, locally as if they were a file system. You basically got a read-only file system there. Um, let's talk a little bit about the artifacts that uh, CA sync will generate for, uh, for you. So uh, we have the, let's actually see if that works. Uh, we have the CAIDX stuff. These are the index files that I mentioned, basically lists of hashes. CIIDX is a, a index file that ref references the directory tree, right? When we operate on the file system layer. CAIBX is the same thing, but um, it's about the serialization of a block device, right? Ultimately, they're exactly the same file format, they're exactly the same stuff. The, they're only named differently to give the user a hint what they actually reference, like are they on the one layer or the other. Then there is a CATAR as suffix. I already mentioned that. That's um, basically when you don't do the chunking and all that stuff, but you just want something like a better tar that is reproducible and mountable. Um, and then there is uh, .CASTR. It's actually suffix for a directory instead of a file. And that's basically a store directory. It's where we put our uh, compressed chunks, right? Like if you CD into that and you can, then you'll just see all the chunk files in there. Nicely compressed and you can verify them with your shell tools if you like to. So this is just to give you a little bit of feeling of, of what actually are the artifacts that you'll see on disk. Um, something I forgot to mention. Uh, when I talked here about the reproducibility of the tar serialization is uh, metadata, right? Metadata means all the stuff that you store about files um, that is not the contents, meaning, for example, m times, like modification times, uh, user uh, stuff like ownership of files and things like that. Um, metadata is a big thing, right? Like Because metadata, um, when it shows up in a serialization, um, usually, like, often um, conflicts with your reproducibility. Right? Like, for example, m times. Um, uh, in some cases, like, for example, if I would uh, uh, back my, uh, up my home directory CA sync every day, I actually care about m times a lot because I actually want to know if I worked on that doc document today and on that document the last week. But for OS trees, it actually doesn't matter. It usually hurts because you want re reproducibility. I mean, we had talking about re reproducible builds, right? Like if you run GCC on your C program today and tomorrow, um, and it uh, generates exactly the same output, then that's a cool thing. And if you then fuck it up by giving them both different M times because you ran it at two different times, then you lose a lot. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to, to, to make here is depending on your use case, you actually have to control what's kind of metadata you actually want to store, right? So if you built an, an IoT image, you probably do not care about M times, but you do care about file ownership, about permission bits, and these kind of things. So um, yeah, in that case, you want this. In the case where I back up my home directory, I do care about the M times, but I probably do not care about things like uh, user IDs, like numeric user IDs and numeric group IDs, because I want the abilities that I can extract this on some other machine where I have a slightly different UID or Git, and I don't want this to conflict, right? So the corollary of that, we probably should have a way how to control precisely which metadata gets stored and restored in, these, in, in the serialization. And that's what, uh, what uh, CI Sync actually provides you with. So we have a couple of switches. Um, this is actually supposed to be dash dash with and dash dash without, but uh, LaTeX found it funny to turn it into one dash. I don't know why, but sure. So um, you, when you invoke CA sync, you actually have this with and without switches, and you can specify precisely what kind of metadata you want. Do you want M times? Do you want ACLs? Would you want extended attributes? Do you want the ButterFS concept like sub volume and things like that? So we are usually, like by default, if you don't specify any uh, anything, we are as precise as possible, right? Like we try to, we actually go into a lot of detail um, about saving and restoring your file system trees um, in, prob in, in a lot more detail actually as, uh, than tar goes. Like for example, because we can store butter as sub-volume information for you, we can um, uh, store like the ch uh, change address stuff, like uh, for those who know Linux well, you, there are a couple of additional file system attributes that you can attach to files to make them immutable and things like that. We can store, uh, we save and restore that for you as well if you like. Some use case might be useful. So, 
Yeah, so much about metadata. Um, CI Sync puts you in control depending on your use case to pick exactly what you want, if you want more or if you want less. Another point that is interesting to discuss because it's a SquashFS images. I already mentioned SquashFS a couple of times. SquashFS, um, for those who don't know, is a compressed file system for Linux. Um, usually compression and chunking conceptually conflict, right? Like because compression is supposed to remove all the entropy of your stream. And that basically means, I mean, the purpose of compression ultimately is in a way that if you make one change at the beginning, that the, the, this will explode into the rest of the, of the stream. This is, of course, exactly what we don't want with CI Sync. However, one would assume then that uh, SquashFS and CI Sync kind of conflict, but that actually they don't. Or because SquashFS is actually a random access file system, right? Like there's, it's efficient to access the file at the end of the file system. Um, they don't actually compress the entire thing um, from top to bottom um, in one single stream. What they instead do is they have some uh, structure how you can find files, and then they uh, uh, um, have uh, some structure how you can find individual blocks, but the blocks are individually uh, compressed, right? So this is actually helps us a lot, because they don't have one compressor that goes from the front of the serialization all the way to the end in one go, but they have actually a, a compressor that starts with this chunk, then ends with a chunk, and then starts with a chunk, and ends with this chunk, and so on. So uh, um, what we can do now is we can actually synchronize that up, right? Like Because if they do this kind of chunking on some level, and we do this kind of chunking on some level, um, we can take benefit of that because we still can recognize uh, the chunks. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to synchronize them up because I didn't do the research. There's the there's the GitHub issue about that specific thing, though. The point I'm really trying to make is, um, yeah, compression by default appears to be contradictory to the chunking stuff, but actually it isn't in real life cases like SquashFS. Um, it's just a matter of you need a little bit of research, like how you pick the uh, chunking size that SquashFS uses in relationship to the one that CI Sync uses. Um, yeah, I mentioned this already. For me, reproducibility is everything, right? Like, I think um, security requires um, uh, reproducibility. That means that if I de deploy an image today and then deploy an image tomorrow, I not only need to guarantee that it's exactly the same version that ends on the machine, but I also need to provide tools that you can verify that. Um, as, as a result of this, um, CI Sync actually uh, has some tools like uh, CI Sync Digest and CI Sync Mtree that, completely outside of the scope of delivering images to people, are actually pretty useful to um, for in a, just a general case. CI Sync Digest, what it does is you uh, uh, invoke it, and then it will calculate a hash sum on the object that you invoke it on. Like for example, if you don't specify any arguments, it will actually operate on the working directory you call it in. And what it will do then, it will um, implicitly, behind the scenes, serialize the, the entire um, working directory, throw all that away, but before throwing it away, it will actually calculate a strong hash function, uh, hash value of it, and then show you the hash value. So seeing digest, see, I think digest is a little bit like invoking um, SHA-256 sum from the command line with a star or something, but then actually doing that recursively for the entire tree in a completely uh, stable and guaranteed way. Uh, CI Sync M3 is pretty similar. M3 is actually a concept that um, was introduced by the BSD people. It's it's short for manifest tree. It's basically a way how you can uh, list a directory tree and show um, like it's a standard file format for that um, uh, for showing a list of files in a directory tree and the hashes so that you can verify them. CI Sync M3 can generate that for you too and can validate that for you as well um, and generate that from an index file or from a directory tree or from everything. So. Yeah, reproducibility matters, and uh, CI Sync is completely outside of the scope of actually delivery, um, provides you these functions. Um, what's kind of cool if you, with CI Sync, is, um, you know, if you, if you have multiple local um, uh, images installed, like for example, you have a couple of container trees, um, they are pretty much all closely related because they're all versions of Fedora that have been adjusted to some specific service, or they are like Ubuntu or whatever you have then it's kind of cool if we can uh, take benefit of the fact that in large parts they contain the same data by telling the file system about it. I'm speaking entirely about uh, running CA Sync on the file system layer now. Um, and for that, you can actually invoke CA Sync with a special switch that tells it 
that when extracting a, a, a CI sync archive, like downloading it from the internet and things like that, that it should use a local pool as a source not only for copying things over, but also for optionally instead creating hard links where that's possible. Right? So it basically allows you to, it's something that, that basically we copied from OS tree, because in OS tree you get this property, right? You, you have one file system tree, and you get another file system tree, and if all the files that are identical are hard linked. With CI sync, you can do the same thing, um, uh, uh, and you can do it completely generically, and, and uh, CI sync will do it for you as you like. So hard links have a bit, of a bit of a problem though, right? Like if you ever modify the tree, um, then both the original tree and the one you modify will change, right? They, they propagate changes ultimately between the trees. Uh, modern file systems, specifically XFS and uh, ButterFS and a couple of others, actually know a concept called ref links, uh, like referential links. Um, it's, a, it's a copy and write concept. It basically, it's like a hard link in a way, so that you can have one file and then have another file, and they have the same contents that only stored once on disk. However, because it's copy and write, it will be changed. Uh, like, as you modify one of these two files, um, the, the, the unification will be split up and you get two um, versions of it. Ref links are kind of cool. Um, CA sync is able to create them for you. So basically, if you have one uh, container tree already unpacked, and you call um, CA sync to uh, unpack a related other container tree, uh, then um, CA sync will um, use the first one as a pool, will recognize similar blocks, um, and then use ref links um, to make sure that the second one is uh, stored as efficiently as possible and reuses as many blocks as possible from the original one. That's actually super powerful, um, and I'm not aware of any kind of tool like this that can do this kind of stuff. Um, something else here. I mean, I got like five minutes left or three minutes left now. I got two more slides or something, um, but I think it's okay if I don't cover them. I'd rather go towards questions, I think. So, uh, if anyone has a question. Thanks. Um, since you said that you don't care that much about the file boundary, is the transfer always an all or nothing proposition, or can you just specify uh, a slice of the destination file system to transfer over? So, um, see, I think has like yeah, you can always um, uh, download only parts of it. Like this is actually used, for example, for this thing. This is say see, I think command where you basically get a local block device that is backed by the data in that index file, right? And as it will basically give you a device node and slash dev called dev um, sd whatever something. And as you access that file, see, I think will go and download the, the chunks needed for exactly that from the server. So you basically get something like an like a on-demand downloading file system thingy. And we can also do that on the, on the file system layer, where you basically say, I want to mount this CAIDX, um, or this index file that references the uh, directory tree serialization, I want to have it locally. And we will not download it in the beginning all. We will download it as you go, and we'll actually ca cache the chunks locally. So it's not an all or nothing thing. It's designed to be random access, and it's designed to, to delay downloads until the point um, where they're actually necessary. Uh, so suppose I have some uh, other tool which wants to unpack file system trees, um, but has no idea how to handle device files, and I want to integrate CA sync into this. Have you considered putting uh, bits somewhere clearly in the hash identifier so that I can tell instantly offline what kind of object I have? Well, I mean, there is no different kinds of object, right? Like in CSync, we split everything up into chunks, right? Like we forget everything about the context of the data that we're operating on, Like right? The serialization for us is just the serialization, and then we chunk it up and store it away. And at that moment, there's only chunks, right? There's no, no object type or anything. So I'm not sure I follow. I mean, at some point, I, I, like, What's, what's, what's interesting to mention is that actually um, CI sync, um, you can also um, pass uh, the, the serialization already prepackaged into CI sync. Like, for example, you could actually use GNU tar to tar something up, push that thing into CI sync, and CI sync will just do the chunking and everything for you then, right? Like, how the serialization um, uh, comes to be, if it's CI sync that generates the serialization, or if you already pass it in, is completely up to you. CA Sync works in both ways. It's, it's relatively generic in that regard. Maybe that's an answer to your question.
Hello, my question would be, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's block device or file system. So if it's block device, I might have like some sparse space left, like for future space, right? Like an embedded or anything. Or if I have a file system and I have sparse files, how do you handle that? Do you just deliver a single chunk for all the zeros or do you ignore it or? Um, that's a very good question. So, um, I mean, you know, the entire system is designed that we recognize chunks, right? And these chunks can have any kind of contents, including nothing like null, right? And then if CSync works correctly, it will recognize that you have zeros here and zeros there and zeros over there and will all merge them into the same chunk with the same hash function. So um, CSync automatically will recognize that and handle it the right way. That said, um, CSync extraction actually is smart. So if it notices that it is extracting a series of zero bytes, it will actually automatically generate um, sparse files, but you can turn that off if you don't like it. Right? So the idea is basically to generate the most efficient um, directory representation possible using ref links, blah, 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 and also sparse files where we can. What CSync doesn't do, however, and it has been requested, but I'm not sure I want to implement that, is that we, sh uh, um, we are not capable of reproducing the exact sparse file layout of your source on the destination. Right? So we will either make it less sparse or we will make it more sparse because uh, we don't actually s uh, store any information about where our holes in the files and where not. We just consider them zeros. Okay, that's my time. If you have any further questions, I'll be around here. And thank you very much for your interest.